Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. On the bench today is the Prelude. So this was a group buy on my Discord. Sparks UK is the chap that we got to thank for this. I'm very grateful, Barry. It's uh, really nice. Uh, they got a choice of colour, black or purple, and I went with purple. So yeah, it's the Prelude Z2 Replica Rev 1.1. So the Prelude is a Zorro 2 sound card for the Amiga. And you may think, why does the Amiga need a sound card? Isn't Paul the good enough? Well, no, not really. The, the sound on Amiga obviously is fantastic, but it's limited. It can do four channels up to 22 kilohertz, a bit beyond that actually on the 4000, you know, the AGA machines. And you've only got eight bit, but you can get higher bit depth there by some clever tricks and things. And I think you can get like 11 bit or something like that. But this provides, you know, like CD audio quality kind of thing. It's got a chip here. Sparks, Barry. It's kindly put all the chips in here. You can see we've got a crystal chip here. So I'm guessing this is like a sound card chipset stuff from something like a PC sound card, which is really cool. I've also got some other bits in here that Barry has kindly provided as well for another project. You'll see in the next uh, you know video potentially some uh, flash ROMs there. So those aren't for this and a CPLD, which might be in there. I think. But the Mac chip is for this, so that's going to be the Glue Logic audio chipset. Something there, maybe a DAC or something like that. Monster, I'm not sure to look at the part number. We've got another small chip, I'm not sure what that's doing. Is that even for this? Mm, that might be for this card actually. Yeah, it might be for this card. Because we've got MPEG, this is an optional MPEG decoder. You can see that it says MPEG it. So, by the pin header, I'm not sure where that fits up here by the looks of things. It's going to fit on there and give you MP3 audio decoding, which is fantastic, isn't it? It's really, really nice. The most expensive part, I think, here, no, well, I think the parts might be uh, 40, 50, 60 quid ish, maybe a bit less. But these PCBs, because it's a full length, you know, you go out of the 10 by 10 or whatever it is that. Many PCB manufacturers have as a you know a cheap option, and you're into you know quite a long length PCB there, and that's one of the reasons why Barry went for you know a number of these like I don't know eight of each or something or ten of each black and purple, and then he's building some up, selling them himself, and then uh, a number of people on Discord has uh, bought these. So you can expect to see one of these on CRG's channel. Glenn, he's picked up one of these. There'll be a link down below. And once he's done his video, if I get this up before his, I'll put a link to his video in the description down below as well. Because you're going to get different things from both of us here. We're probably going to test things differently, may assemble differently, and may run into different problems. So, yeah, I'm very, very pleased. Thank you ever so much, Barry. You've done a sterling job on getting together, hopefully, it looks like, everything we need here to build this relatively quick. Now, there was some support by Stefan over in Denmark, I believe, in terms of maybe some of the chips, the Max maybe, some of the gals potentially. I'm honestly not sure. I think Stefan may have programmed these up because they're numbered. That's like one, three, two, four. So that's really nice, isn't it? I don't even need to program them by the looks of things. And then we've got a load of 7 4 series, presumably, there. Some ferrites, look audio connectors, lots of sockets, uh, quite a lot of resistors, quite a lot of caps as you'd expect, more sockets, more sockets, more audio connectors, more caps, those look nice, got a plastic body on them but yeah, nicely assembled, I'm not sure about the size of those or anything, uh, anyway let's just sort of move all this stuff over there and I think I'm going to start to build this, so it looks like the ferrites go here, FB, that's, uh, hang on where have they gone? those that's what those are going to be yeah you tend to have these on input outputs you know just to help filter so that's I presume where those are going to go and we'll get the audio connectors there I'll probably need to go and order myself some cables for mixing purposes here because what you can do is run the audio out of the Amiga and I think there's probably a line in or something here so you go from your two RCA phonos into three and a half mil and then when we go out well depending on what you're connected up to you may need to go back to two phonos again so I'm probably going to need RCA to three and a half mil stereo jack and then three and a half mil stereo jack to two RCAs to keep my existing wiring set up anyway I will report back when we've got those things on well, this is a good start. I am fixing things already. I've mentioned this before. You can send out 100 different products to 100 different people, and I'll be the one where something goes wrong or is wrong from the start. 
And what happened here, let me just show you if I can get the tool. Oh, I don't know, use these pliers. The pin that look, you can see it, it's just fallen off. That pin there was bent over and I bent it just a little bit like that and it would snap straight away from one bend. So it's just hanging there, about to fall off. Uh, you know, it's just floating around. What I'm going to do is, because there's going to be a nut around this, so this is ground, I'm going to get some of this super fine cable, you know, make it bare so that it's, it makes contact with the metal, wrap it around that once or twice, stick the nut on, and then wrap it around that pin, fit this socket first and solder it on. So yes, that pin will not be joined to the actual metal shield, but what it will be is joined to the wire, which is wrapped around there and then held with a nut. So it will be all right, but that's just my look. It's the first one I picked up. It had a bent pin, touched it with a screwdriver, snap. It's just hard to believe, really. All right, I kid you not, it took me 10 minutes to get that first one on, but 10 minutes to get one connector on. Yeah, I did exactly what I described. I put the coil wire, used the fiberglass pen on it, asked it to get rid of the coating, wrapped it around, put the nut on, and then put it through the hole, even put the pin back in and soldered it on. So if we now test, I guess, from at that point there to here. There we go, got a join. This here was pointing downwards a bit. It, it's not straight on the board, and you can sort of see that here. If I rotate it, it's still not perfectly straight. It's still pointing downwards a little bit here. It's like it goes on one side and then not the other. How can it be so hard to get these in? Now the ground's not going in. There we go. That's it. Yeah, they're just very, very tight. Again, it's pointing downwards a bit. So this is where just bending it just slightly. I'm reluctant to use the pliers, but I don't know whether this is something with these sockets, but it's doing the same thing. If you look at this line here, yeah, look at that line there in regard to that edge. You can perhaps see if you get it straight on, you can sort of see the line touches here and up here there's a bit of a gap. So it's kind of pointing downwards. So as much as I don't like to, I'm just sort of gripping it and bending slightly like that. Yeah, it's the same as that one now, it's nearly there. Every one of these here has been painful to do, all with the same issues. So yeah, trying to get all the pins lined up, using magnification, you know, until you can see the little pin on the other side and manipulate a bit and then, I don't know, eventually if you get it in just the right spot, tongue at the right angle. You can see it likes to go in on one side and then not the other. And this is the problem, taking it off and inspecting, but they all look perfectly straight. I think it's just the design here is pretty tight, you know, the holes are pretty small. And hopefully you can see the problem that I've had here with all four. This one has just been pushed on finally and there's hardly any gap on the silk screen there. Yeah, but there is up the top there. You know, if you look at it in relation with these ones here, these ones look fairly straight, and this one here, there's more of a gap between the silk screen there and the you know the actual plastic. So again, I'll do the same thing with this one. That is almost straight now. I'll give it one more tweak and then I'll solder that on. Yeah, you could argue that if these are not straight, when we come to put a plate on, I mean, it could cause some issues, but it probably won't do, as long as the hole is slightly bigger than the threads there. I thought it was going to be a nut short. So, yeah, there we go. Brilliant. Just tighten those a little bit, just so they don't fall off. So the next thing is, I'll do these. So I'll show you one of these. Measure it up against the uh, thing here. You can get tools, plastic 3D printed tools. You can make one yourself that will bend one of these, but I just tend to just, you know, push like that and bend. And you can see we've got almost the right angle there. Same on the side here, just sort of push and manipulate a little bit like that. If you haven't got the alignment right, you may need to just pull like this a little bit, just to sort of pull it flat with the PCB. Hopefully you'll agree spacing and everything there and the leg length is just about right yeah i leave these for slightly longer than you might expect just so the solder goes through to the other side the solder contains flux there we go so when those are cleaned up those will look okay yeah and you can see what i mean 
got a little solder beak there and we have, don't have one there I didn't need that one long enough but anyway I will continue on and report back when all of these are populated as you can see this PCB here was created by Wiretap Retro you can see the GitHub link page here and there will be a link to that down below and just doing what I always do, totally mixing things up random order, chaos, chaos and shoes on many of my videos so yeah what I'm doing is just anchoring all of these sockets making sure the pins are all straight they're all level here, none of them being pushed through finding somewhere to stick the darn thing making sure pin 1 is right so the little notch semicircles to the left because it is on the silk screen flip it over, anchor it on two points, make sure it's nice and straight, adjust if necessary yeah, I figure if I just start anchoring some of these things, I'll feel happier. Yeah, that's pretty straight. So, I'll do the same thing. With the other sockets, you can see I just anchored that one, two points there. I haven't finished over here yet. Yeah, so the socket that was on the end here has suffered a bit of an ouchy look <laughs> in transit. Those pins are sideways. Yeah, try and straighten it. And they obviously they need straightening two orientations here, sort of bending back up in a line almost and then going in at the sides like this I need to use my magnifier there we go try not to go past where it needs to go because that's the point where it'll break off when you go forwards backwards forwards backwards then they break yeah I, I don't think Sparks likes me anymore he sent me a socket without a pin look <laughs> I've got a pin missing maybe that one's not important which one was the one that doesn't use that pin I don't know uh, it's not the ground or VCC pin, so you never know, it might actually not be needed. It's really cool though that it's included all these sockets with this kit, because I mentioned before, I think like 90% of the time is ordering the bloody past, to be honest. I mean, it probably isn't, but for me it is. It takes me an eternity ordering all the parts. And then, of course, the other thing is, and I guess this is why Sparks does a batch of these, is uh, everything comes in packs of like 10, 20, whatever and that's where you get the most cost savings so just ordering individual parts is uh, you know, never a good idea and that's often what I will do and it costs me a small fortune for that very reason so yeah, Sparks takes all the hard work out of these builds for me and uh, yeah, I can't thank him enough he's a real legend he really is and in the time that I've been doing this, he's got like, I think six or eight of these pre-assembled that he's done. I don't know how he works so fast, that's too big for those, and it's one of these ones. Pin one, two, the top. I always like check everything, double check everything as I'm going along, including the alignment. And of course with these sockets, you don't necessarily need to fit sockets. I'm glad he uh, took the time to get these sockets though. Because you never know, you can get a dodgy gal or something like that, and then you spend hours and hours and hours trying to work out what's going on. If you can take the gals off, it's pretty easy to program a replacement just to test a replacement. Yeah, just adjust in there, just trying to get that nice and straight. That's it, we're getting there, aren't we? Of course, there's going to be a million solder points to do. I'll come back to that short socket when I've gone and found a spare pin yeah what I was going to say though before about the sockets I've got loads of those little 8 pin ones as soon as I saw the position of the board I was like yay you get to use one of the sockets and I looked at this pile of sockets like oh Sparks has included one <laughs> which is yeah it's really kind of him I might send him all those 8 pin sockets with the next thing that I send him it's just to say thanks and then he'll have a million of them in his component drawer wondering what to do with them Not only is this gold plated, not hassle, but I like the elongatedness of these pads. You get nice solder points with that type of pad. Yeah, so here's one I raided earlier. I think this is the one I used on Anthony's A500 keyboard, actually, the one from uh, you know, the Ghost one. Oh, drop that pin on the floor now. You know, this floor seriously winds me up. Things land on this floor and they just cease to exist. They cease to exist. It's like there's a glitch in the matrix. Anything that goes down here is gone. Never to be seen, ever. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, sorry about that little intermission. It's amazing how long it takes me to find things when they go on the floor. And uh, other people would have just got another pin out there, gone, oh, screw that pin. I'm not going to go look for that pin. But uh, talking about someone who gets irritated when a pin is aligned slightly, you know, 0.0001 degrees off. So, like, when I drop a pin on the floor, I'll go to bed at night and I'll be thinking about that pin. I'll be lying in bed going, I need to find that pin tomorrow. I need to find that pin. That pin's bothering me. Wonder where it went. Yeah, so that pin, it works, but it doesn't look the same as the other ones, it doesn't matter. Uh, once the chip's in there, you'll never even know. So the resistor networks are both the same size, so can I get these mixed up? Pin one is towards the right here, so you've got to get, it's got a dot there on the left. Yes, yeah, so the dot goes towards the square pad there. Might as well solve these in entirety. But I'll, I'll just anchor with one or so pins to start with, just make sure they're straight. Yeah, so I've skipped quite a lot of the build here because, you know, it, it's similar stuff. Well, it's all samey. You just put the component on, solder the legs, that's it. <laughs> There's nothing to it. Yeah, you do need to make sure you get your pin ones right on things like that. I'm not even sure whether I checked that now. I think I did. Or did I just stick it straight on? <sighs> I've got myself worried here. Yeah, the slant's down there. I'm not honestly sure whether I looked at that and checked that. I just somehow seem to get it right. And you do need to make sure that you know your pin one is towards the left on these ones, on these ones here it's towards the right. So there's some variation where pin one is on these things. Everything is going on really well though. So we've got some more of these capacitors here. So I'll stick these on. They're not polarised. That little blue one there, 47 microfarad. I was a bit worried about that, thinking surely that's got to be polarised, but there's no indication on the board, there's no indication on the component. And I asked Sparks about that, he said, no, I think he thinks it's bipolar. You know, it's uh, non-polarised, it's like a ceramic or something. I haven't even needed to look at the bill of materials here. You know, it's obvious, when you look at these, it's got a square thing, capacitor, square. Yeah, well, we just happen to have exactly the right amount to fill all those spaces, so I haven't needed to look at the, uh, like I said, the bill of materials to check the part numbers or anything. A lot of the ceramic caps, the yellow ones, I'll show you in a sec, with that fitted, it's marked on the PCB, you know, it says like 33 nanofarad, I think it's four of those 100 nanofarad. There are some thousand picofarads, I think. Yeah, it's totally pedantic, but I like to get things really square within the uh, silk screen there. Right, so those four there were 33 nanofarad, I think. You've got a couple of thousands, a thousand peak farad or a thousand nanofarad there. Uh, 100 nanofarad, 100 nanofarad, 100 nanofarad. All these here are 100 nanofarad. It's, uh, it's really easy to assemble. The fiddly bit is doing these resistors. There's loads of different sizes. Th those might all be the same, I don't know, but there's loads of different sizes of resistors here and there's some caps as well. One or two of the caps he's not been able to find uh, you know, the right type for, so we've got some ceramics here. Yeah, and we're onto a new reel of solder. My last roll, or reel, ran out. So that was like brown alert time. <laughs> Luckily I did have some more solder. And this solder came from CPC, actually in Preston. It's the Loctite stuff, you know, leaded 6040 with flux. The interesting thing with CPC is I used to use CPC as one of the main parts um, suppliers back in the day. But CPC were a Commodore distributor. Their, their catalog, I used to love looking through the latest CPC catalog, it was like so, you know, so thick. And it was, you know, split into different sections of different manufacturers, and the Commodore section had every dip IC that Commodore had available. You know, all the different Agnes's and I don't know, everything, CIA's, Gary's, Denise's. We always used to order spares from CPC. But they also had a lot of service manuals and stuff as well. I've got one or two of those. I've got the 500 slash 2000 one somewhere. You know, proper Commodore manual that Commodore distributed to CPC. And they're still around, hence why I've got that. And they're based in Preston. I'll try and work out where those tantalums go. I hate dealing with tantalums because you've got to get them the right way around polarity wise. And unlike, say, electrolytics, where the stripe indicates the negative, the marker on these indicates the positive, and actually it's got 
a line and a positive symbol on the, oh, the right hand side of these as we see those like that there. So that's indicating the positive. Yeah, the positive is indicated on the tantalum, unlike electrolytics. So based on the original Prelude Zorro 2 card, obviously, but half length one, as you can see here, again, it's credited with Thomas Wenzel. So he's had an involvement in both of these. I'm not sure if he was the original creator of the original Prelude, actually. And you can see this half length card here over on Wrangler Amiga. There'll be a link to his channel below. It's an amazing channel. Over on the big book of Amiga hardware, you can see the original that this remake is based on. So the Prelude is a full-length Zorro 2 16-bit sound card, contains 2K FIFO, a CSSC 4231A sound processor capable of playing A-Law, U-Law, 8-bit, 16-bit, AD, PCM encodings. Prelude also contains a built-in sampler, full duplex capable of recording at rates from 5.1 kHz up to 64 kHz. Wow, that's incredible. Prelude has line-in, mic-in, built-in amplifier, 2 times auxiliary in, mono in, mono out, and an internal audio input. Several expansion mods are available for the Prelude, including the Arpeggiator, the Mpegit, and the Rombler. So we've got the Mpegit here. I was thinking about this. I'm going to go away and look now if I've got any sockets, because I prefer to socket these things. I don't really like sticking things straight on. Because if you ever have a problem, well, you're kind of knackered. You've got to desolder it. Yeah, I found a socket here. That's going to be okay. The only issue we've got here is that cap there is kind of bang in the middle of uh, where it needs to be on the edge, you know. So what I'll probably do is just file a little hole there and fit that there and get the cap on first. And to socket this up, I am going to cut the base out here. You've seen me do this before. Just snip the little struts one by one. You can just literally just, you know, push them like that. They snap off, that's it, and they're all breaking off. Yeah, so I mean, I shouldn't be fitting this just yet, because we aren't at that point, are we? But I just like to do things in random order. The only thing you got to pay attention to, really, is whether soldering a particular component on a particular time means something else is going to be challenging. E.g. here, the cap. We need to deal with the cap before we commit to soldering that on. Yeah, so looking at the socket here, you can see the cap, it goes up to a pin there, and the other one goes to the pin next to it. So what I'm going to do is fit the socket on and get like a really small SMD 100 nanofarad uh, cap, and just mount it between the two pins. And there we go, anchored on, so soldered to one point, one point over there. So it looks perfect in terms of the profile there. So you're going to get some flux around that now, and use the flat tip, you know, the wedge tip there on the Antex iron to solder all the contacts. Yeah, anything to avoid putting heat into that Mac chip. But it's also far easier, I think, to fit a socket like this rather than try and solder that PLCC Mac chip. And it just makes it a wee bit more serviceable. Get some solder on the tip. And start on a point where you've not anchored it. So I'm going to start on this side here, there's no solder on this side. Yeah, and they are very tight on the pads. So you sort of got to heat the pad and the pin, you know, go over the actual pin. And the solder does flow. So, uh, yeah, it's only going to take uh, five or six minutes to do this, I think. And then I'll clean up before I solder anything else on this board, because there's quite a lot of flux going to be around here. Anyway, I'll report back in a minute, and I'll give you a macro on that socket. So just having a look around the pins there, they look fine I think, good joins on all points. This is going to be a bit tight fitting the PLCC chip here, but I'll start on that side I think and should be alright. With this little chip here, just anchoring it in, and it's one of these where there's hardly any space around the pads, you know, so I got it as straight as I could, held it down like that and just soldered one pin. And then it wasn't quite straight, so I just, you know, heat that one pin carefully with a bit of flux and just adjusted it under magnification. So it's now totally square, exactly where it should be. Going to solder down here on this bottom right pin. That's it. Press down on it. We flow it. There we go. That's it. So that, oh, hang on, the chips just fell off on the floor. I'm going to try and order a socket for that PLCC. 
the other one because there is enough space here even with the cap so I may as well I will toothbrush around there in a minute when I've done these so I'm going to get some flux there just anchored that little chip there pin one is here top corner there let's get some solder onto the tip here yeah and I will be using my magnifier make some pairs for that yeah and I'm just going to bob it in to start with there we go just drag across the pins here and then see where I'm at yeah so there's a few bridges there's a bridge there successfully brush them all together there now let's just leave that side come back in a minute and that's the thing if you've still got solder on the tip just leave a bit of solder on the tip uh, start the side and connect because there's a big block there so we'll there. there we go I've just got that in one pass you probably won't be able to see very well from that distance but the beauty of when you get down to the point where there's only just enough solder on the tip it will flow a lot easier and we'll come back around here because there's some very little solder on the tip if we flow where it was bridged, yeah, yeah, no, it still won't too much solder on the side. Needs a bit more flux, I think. Clean the solder off the tip as you can, and then just have a simple drag, and you'll find the tip will absorb some of that solder. Every now and again, just a dab into the braid there to uh, remove any solder. We go, go rid of all the bridges. That's it. That's looking good that side and that side. That's all four sides of that chip done. So I'm just going to leave the tiny bit of solder we've got on the tip here. And uh, I can't see what I'm doing, but I'm going to go for it anyway. I'm going to solder on the side where there was no anchoring. There we go. And just drag along like that. And then drag along back that way. There we go, you can see hopefully that side is done. Right, that's those two ICs soldered on. So cotton buds and IPA again. In fact, I'm not going to toothbrush it just yet. I think I'll wait till I've got all the other SMD components on, but yeah, hopefully you can see that's looking pretty good. So a huge jump cut later, a few hours it's taken me. All of the resistors and caps and everything are on there. So the only thing I'm missing is these headers and things here and the chips. And on the main board, I'm gonna go order a socket in a minute. I'm gonna need to get the crystal on that, I need to get the passives onto this. But I was playing with the I or toying with the idea of mounting this on the back because the original prelude had it on the back. And you can see here what I've done is I've taken a 40 pin IDC connector that's keyed. It came from one of the projects Glenn sent me actually, the LAN IDE clock port, so there'll be a video on that coming up soon. I've just bent the plastic on there. Um, anyway, I took this off and put a 90 degree one on, because it just fit better there. So I'm going to reuse that here, I've got the other connector in there. I'm going to mount it here with the key face down, and I'm going to solder it on on the underside, because I've measured up the distance. If you have it on the top side, Sparks mentioned you need really long headers on here which means you need it about that height which means you know it's pretty wide so things to the right might interfere with but you can have the same problem on the other side but just by virtue of doing this you'll see that well I've measured it up and when this is I can get it on on that side there the diameter here the diameter here is actually less than it would be if it's up here when you've got sockets if you've not got these things socketed then you could use this type of connector and have it on that side and then this is going to have the chips facing outwards and be soldered on there like that you could argue solder it straight on and have like really short connectors and solder it almost level with this of course we can't get access to the solder points there but we can if we disconnect it yeah and then just sort of inspect down it here make sure it's nice and straight and it is and everything's level and stuff so yeah we'll anchor a few more points and then uh, later I'll finish off by soldering the remaining connections on that
but that's good reuse of that connector that Glenn kindly sent me. At this point here I took the compact flashcard out of my Amiga, put it into my PC, he used WinUAE, the emulator there, and copied across the LHA archives that I needed. So the Prelude library, the AHI, files, mixer, MPEGIT library and Amiga amp. Alright, I'll just reflow those now and then we are done. Right, so wrist strap on, let's get these chips in. I'll clean up the board later. So we've got four chips here that are labelled one, two, three, four. Legs are a bit gull winged. They've been pre programmed these by Stefan over in Denmark. So a massive thanks to Stefan. And I think he was the one that provided these uh, gals actually. So this one's got four, and I think it goes one, two, three, four. The particular chips we've used here are GAL 20 V8s. So then in this other tub here, we've got a load more chips. Got two FIFOs at the front. How do we know? Well, they're huge. <laughs> Look at them. Uh, right, pin one of these is to the right. Yeah, let's just put them in here, because you know what? Whilst they look squished in, they're not. They are slightly cool because they're new. Uh, and looking at the building materials here, F245 is U1, U8, U11. That's it. So, I just need to just inspect the silk screen to make sure all my pin ones are right, like those three are all to the right, and these ones are all to the left, those ones are to the right, and then we've got top, 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 top. That all looks good. So the only thing we're missing off here now is the sound. I see there's a tiny bit of oxidisation, certainly on the underside. If you look at the pins on the underside there, but that doesn't make a connection. If I just put this flat on the table, I'm just going to go gently over the sides here. Pins are all flat. Let's try that again, get it aligned with the left side, and then the right side, and the bottom top. Oh god, that's just really stiff. Really stiff fit that. Yeah, that's in. So 2000 board back on the bench, booted up all okay. Let's just get some IPA on this side. Just give it a quick go. Once I've proven it all works, then I'll clean it. You never know, we might be doing some rework here. So let's now get this in. Wow, well, that's a, a long boy, isn't it? <laughs> it's super long. Yeah, you can see, I think with the PCB on the end there, that might interfere with this card, so you know what, I might have to move that yet. I don't know, it's hard to tell. I mean, if it was in the left-hand slot, it'd be all right, but, well, you block an ISO slot when you use that left-hand slot, that's the problem. Right, let's hold both mouse buttons down, switch it on. Green screen. Now, green screen on this is usually bad power. And when I say bad power, it's not normally green screen. Green screen is actually a chip RAM issue. But on this board here, if my power is bad, if I have you know slightly low 5 volts, it will give me a green screen. But it is giving me a green screen, so we have some sort of problem. Let's just move it to another slot. Let's move it over here. If I want to be able to reach my hand in, I'll put it right over there and feel as if it's getting warm. And the answer is no. Nothing actually hot after that short power on, power off. But we are getting a green screen. Ah, something is getting hot. Something is getting very, very hot there. Ah, oh, you know what the problem is, and I've just killed it. Yeah, that's killed it. That is the most ridiculous design ever. Pin one. Pin one. These are opposite way around. So I think that's probably just killed that ramp. So you know what I was saying about ordering some gold top ones? I think I may have to do that. 
because I think I've just killed that ram. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, so pin one here and then pin one over there. How did I not spot that? The other ones are all alright. Anyway, let's switch it off and let's boot them okay now. So let's put it back in. Let's just see if that ship still gets hot. If it doesn't work for some reason, I'm going to just finger press uh, these here to switch them. Yeah, it's not getting hot. And it's booting now. Sometimes you can look out with things like that because when they get really hot, there's a reason for it. And what it usually is, is protection diodes inside. Usually somewhere that you ex you know you don't expect, you know, it's like, I don't know, ones across data lines or something like that, where you just get a direct short somewhere. And if those haven't completely shorted and burnt out inside it, you might find it still works. I've had that issue with like EPROMs and things like that in the past, if you accidentally get one of those around the wrong way, they go absolutely boiling hot like that was, but if you spot it quick enough, not a problem. And that's one of the reasons why when I had the green screen, I switched straight off, I didn't leave it for like 10 seconds, 20 seconds or longer, you want a short period of time, anyway it's booted. Yeah, that wasn't what I was planning on doing, I got distracted, what I wanted to do was hold both mouse buttons and check the early boot, but with those I go straight into sysinfo, and look at boards, Zorro 2. Because the top one is the 536, isn't it? And this is 64K. So, yeah, it would seem to be reported by AutoConfig. Uh, right, let's try and install the software. I can remember where Libs is, it's in here somewhere, isn't it? Those Libs, get rid of that. I assume it goes in here. Oh, that's the MPEG library. Oh, we've got two, we've got the MPEG library. We've got the Prelude library. I guess the only other thing is the mixer. Can I open perhaps? Yeah, I've seen that before. Um, someone else had that on a, another video, I'll post a link down to his video, I'll show you a clip of that in a minute actually, it's a really good video, where he looks at the prelude. So if we just do save, quit. So, there was something he did and he had to load some module or something in the startup, but I can't remember what it was. I don't think it was the mixer because that just loaded, didn't it? I didn't need to do load module or something, I can't remember what it was he, he had to do there now. Um, let's just go into Workbench, WB Startup is that one, isn't it? So let's just put the mixer in there. Um, we're going to need to reboot because we've got the libs and stuff sorted now. So I'll just power cycle that. Right. Yeah, so the mixer's loaded straight away there. So I think what I should do is connect a speaker up. Right, a massive thanks to Andy Tricklebank. He has found PRL check. I spent ages looking for it. The original website is gone. It's been removed from AmiNet. I can only imagine the original company or author said, I want you to remove that from there, which is just ridiculous. It's like how people get so protective over some of this stuff, it's just nuts. So we need to do LHA extract PRL check 39 LHA. Hopefully this version is going to work on here. Let's have a look. PRL check. PRL check. This program will perform some level checks on the prelude. Continue. Yes. Checking FIFO, ooh, ooh. Now I heard nothing there. I heard no sound at all. Turn the volume up. Let's just run that again. Because it should play a sample if it was working. Yeah, that's not sounding good, is it? Makes me think the FIFO could be the issue there. I don't know, that wasn't working though, and everything is right here. I mean, it says here, checking FIFO status interrupts, idle status okay before reset, play FIFO fill status okay, ideal status okay after reset, Re record FIFO fill status okay, 
Right, after a lot of messing around, we're now booting with the TF520, yeah? That, that card that everyone says, nah, that's a waste of time, don't use that, you know, it's much faster cards, even Stevie himself. Saying, put that in the bin, you don't want a TF520, it's pointless. Well, actually it's not, it works with this now. So this tells me it's either an incompatible with the 536 or the 030. This software needs an 020 or greater. I tried it with stock 68k, it wouldn't work. You can hear the sample works. So, yeah, and that's consistent. I tried with the 536 over and over and over, wasn't getting anywhere with it. And it works every single time on here. So I'm pleased because we've now got some evidence it works. Um, I think what I might do is split this video into a couple of parts. We'll come back in part two, get the MPEG card working. And find some of the ways to test this. But the main thing is, we've got it working. So, yay, it's fantastic. And that FIFO did not die from being fitted the wrong way around, which is the main thing. And you can see how assessment there, TF520, LAN IDECP from Glen, the Prelude and 4 meg of the Gotta Go Fast Ram 2 from Live 2. I set it to 4 meg because these things are going to be using some of that space and I just thought it would be easier just to set it to 4 meg. So yeah, it works fine like that, but if we remove this, get its compact flashcard back in. So it's exactly the same setup here. Well, minus the clock port thing, that's not going to be causing the issue because we've got one less card here, if anything. The only difference is we're using the 536. VRL check. Yes. I'm guessing we're going to get the click, click, click stuff again. Yeah. I mean, one thing that is different there is the speed here is ridiculous. Yeah? This is much faster. Is it too fast for the FIFO? Yeah, so A2630, the IDE clock port LAN, it's booting. The sound card, the prelude, and live 2 4 meg. About the same speed there, maybe a bit faster actually. Yeah, there you go, it works. So it's a 5.36 issue. Well, that's interesting and annoying. So interestingly, I've worked out that the problem with the 536 is about CPU cache and instruction, you know, data cache, instruction cache. You can see I've got no cache burst, no cache burst for data and instructions. So I'm not sure what the burst on the end means. I presume it means it's got burst modes enabled. And if we do PRL check now, it works. What's interesting about that? Well, maybe not. I was going to say the A2630. Isn't that got caches enabled? Because I'm, I was booting the same way. And it works on there. Maybe it's through that burst mode, but then burst mode's on at the moment, assuming. Let's do cache. Do we have to do no burst? Yeah, there we go. Cache, no burst. Let's try it again. Yeah, not working again. And if we do CPU no cache. So maybe the 030 running at 50 MHz here is just too fast when cache is enabled. It's not something I would have expected, but maybe that's what it is. So using the tape deck here, you can see I'm recording on the line in one of my videos. So let's stop that, see if that's worked. I'll stop the video. I'm actually playing my phone through this. Here we go. And can you play back there? I don't know. Yeah, you've got to select the file and go back, parent. There it is. Test. How's that 54? That's not right. Ah, okay. So that's just got a small little clip. I mean, I guess what we can do is just to try the mixer here. So if I just press play. Yeah, so the line in is working. That's quite cool. So I'm going to move it to the top one, which I think is mic. Yeah, that's not working. So.
not really sure what the top one is. The bottom one. See what that is. That's Oaks one. There's a, I was going to say, I put these up to full, but yeah, I don't need to. So, Oaks two. I suspect that's the CD in connector. Wave is it's obvious what wave is, it's your you know wave playback from the card. Mono. I don't know what mono is either. Let's try the master. Yeah. Well that works. So looking at the card here, the top one is marked Mike. Output is the second one down. Third one down is line. And then the fourth one down is aux one, I think. And then I think the connector here, the four pin connector on this card is aux two. So it's just this top one that I am not sure what it does. And I appreciate it gets really confusing listening to me speaking over myself on my own videos. Let's just turn that line down a bit. Anyway, let's just go back to what I was trying to do, which was recording. Yeah, so this software records two seconds. If I hit play now. So, yeah, you get a short sample. Good for recording instruments for use with, like, you know, mod trackers and things like that. It's a wee bit fuzzy. You can adjust the volume here. Yes, yeah, so the way volume works. I've got a cable here, it's a bit long, I've ordered some short ones. So we've got two RCA phonos going to 3.5mm stereo, we've got line in there, output there, the mic still haven't got working, we might visit that in part two. But what we should get now is audio passing through from the Amiga side and we should be able to you know, adjust its volume level as well. Yeah, and we do. So it's coming out from the speakers, I've got the floor down here. And it's in stereo correctly. So that's sweet. And I can show you that's not coming out of the TV. If I unplug the RCA follows and plug in the ones that go to the TV. There you go, it's coming from the TV. So yeah, it's a bit louder, but the reason being is the mixer inputs are set, I don't know, about 90% or something. So if I increased it to 100%, it'd probably sound exactly the same through the, uh, you know, the speakers I've got to the output of the same card. Yeah, so it's going a bit long there, so I've just now removed this and let's have a look at what state we're in, really. So, yeah, I looked out that having that chip round the wrong way didn't blow the thing to smithereens. It is working, as far as I can tell. There was a point earlier where I didn't have that in, but when I was testing the mic, I did have that in. Yeah, I noticed that very quickly. Um, on the underside here, really dirty and fluxy, so we need to clean that up in the next part and finish the thing for there. Might have to relocate that on this side, I'm not sure yet. I'm waiting for the socket for the MPEG adapter, so we'll test the MP3 stuff out in the next video. But we'll try and have a look at other software. If you've got any suggestions, post in the links down below. Primarily, AHI is the stuff that I'm interested in. So, what is AHI? You'll have seen the annotation earlier on, by the way, where I briefly sort of skipped over the installation of that. AHI, think of direct audio, you know, think of DirectX for Windows. Direct uh, component of that was direct audio. What was that? You know, well, it was a standard sort of standardization, really, of libraries that were brought in by Microsoft that meant people could just stick, you know, different games onto Windows for different hardware that would use different sound cards, different graphics cards, and always work. Yeah, you know, you, you've got like a, a middleman. DirectX was the middleman, and Direct Sound was the middleman into sound cards. AHI is kind of the Amiga, you know, OS equivalent, really. So, 4.18 seems to be the most compatible version. There is a new one, version 6, but you just run into problems with lots of older software. So 4.18 is what I would install if you get one of these, or any other sound card for that matter. But in the next video, we'll see if we can get some software that utilizes AHI. ScumVM is one of those programs. But ScumVM, you really need like an 040 or an 060. I can't get it to run here. I don't have enough chip RAM 
processor is not fast enough, even with the TF530. So anyway, huge thanks to Barry, Sparks UK. I do hope you found the video interesting. Massive thanks to Stefan as well for programming up, uh, not that, the uh, Mac chip. You'll see the next part on these chips here. Thank you very much for watching. I will catch you in the next video.